Good afternoon, good evening, welcome everyone. We're just pausing a couple moments as everyone gets logged in here. Bill uh, Taylor. <laughs> oh, that's a name. I haven't seen Bill in years. How you doing, Bill? <laughs> If you want to respond to Dave, you can uh, definitely make comments in the chat room uh, section. Happy to hear questions or um, hellos or anything there since I, I did mute everybody. So sorry about that. Bob Schroggy, Ruth Bamberger, Rose Clyer. Bob Schroggy is a future guest yes. uh, on next week's show. Greg Foltz, Mary Ensweiler. <laughs> If you're just joining us, thank you so much. We're just letting everyone in here and then we will get started. I think one of my relatives is even on here. Mark Irig. Uh, I went to school with Mark <laughs> down the street from him. Awesome. Mark was Mark's a couple years younger than me though. Let's see. Let's see. All right. Um, well, it's two minutes after. So I think we will go ahead. I'm going to turn to my technology person for just a second. Are you able to let people in? No. Okay. No problem. All right. My name is Tara Johnson Nome, and I am a uh, member of the Board of Trustees for Behringer Crawford Museum. And I just want to welcome you all to our first ever Northern Kentucky History Hour. Um, this was an idea that my husband Shane and I um, shamelessly stole from the White House Historical Society because <laughs> we love their Christmas ornaments and so we decided to sign up for the Historical Society membership and now turns out for members they have a uh, regular um, event like this where they bring on local uh, or national historians to talk about White House uh, and presidential history and we thought wouldn't that be great to have something like that for Northern Kentucky where people could really connect to um, our local historians and, um, you know, in every topic across Boone, Kenton and Campbell counties. And so uh, we are so excited to have uh, Dave Schroeder as our first guest. And, um, you know, it's just going to be a great night. Before we get started, I do just want to say a couple of things about the Behringer Crawford Museum. Um, Behringer Crawford is supported in part by our members, by the city of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, let's see, I don't want to leave anybody out, Arts Wave, the Kentucky Arts Council, the Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale uh, Jr. U.S. Bank Foundation, and all the people that normally would be visiting the museum who um, we will be reopening as soon as we are able. So thank you to everyone for coming tonight. We appreciate it. If you want to learn more about membership, we'll talk about that uh, later in the in the show at the end. Um, let's see. Oh, I also want to say thanks to my co-creator, Shane Nome, and our three kids who have been learning a lot about Northern Kentucky history lately. <laughs> um, a few housekeeping items. Uh, we have everyone muted just so that everyone can hear, and so we appreciate your help and cooperation with that. Um, you are welcome to leave your video um, on if you like. You're welcome to turn it off as well. Um, I do recommend that if you um, are able to do just the speaker view, which should be either in the upper left-hand corner of your screen or maybe the very top of your screen, there's a gallery view and a speaker view that'll help you focus just on Dave when he's talking. And if you have a question that you think of during his presentation, um, absolutely just comment on in the chat room feature. You should be able to do um, a drop down and, and add something to the chat. And then we will be compiling everyone's comments and questions. And uh, we'll get to as many of those as we have time for. And then uh, Dave is also gonna share some additional resources that he's created that you can check out to learn more also. Um, okay, so we're just gonna jump right in. Um, Shane and I have a list of over 100 potential topics for Northern Kentucky History Hour. So you might be wondering, how did we choose Ludlow Lagoon as our first episode? And partially, that's because we think it is a fascinating topic that not enough people in Northern Kentucky know about. 
And the other reason is because we needed a guest who would be kind and flexible with us as we are learning in this new project. And so we could not think of a better person to fit both of those than Dave Schroeder, who is also a board member of mine in my work life. So uh, we have double thanks to him. Dave, as most of you may know, is a native of Ludlow. He was named executive director of the Kenton County Public Library in April of 2007, but he began his career at the library in 1986 as a shelver, and I saw recently on Facebook that he got back to those, his roots not that long ago, helping to get the library reopened again very soon, June 8th, we think. So um, in 1987, he began working in the local history department. And he kept right on with those roots uh, as he became archivist for Thomas, what was then Thomas More College and the Diocese of Covington until the year 2000. He returned to the library then when he became the Kentucky History Historian. He serves as a leader in a number of roles locally and at the state level. And um, we just really appreciate all that he does for our community. He is the, also the author of Life Along the Ohio, a sesquicentennial history of Ludlow, Kentucky, and a co-author of Lost Northern Kentucky, uh, which was published in 2018. So um, let's see, I am going to turn it over to Dave, and I think he has a quiz question for you all. Oh, oh no, wait. There okay. you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, okay. and Dave, just yeah. so everybody knows, if they want to respond to the quiz, the first person with the correct answer that we find in the chat, not sure what the prize is going to be yet, but we'll get you something. Okay. So we are, uh, I'm going to be talking about one of the attractions at the lagoon, which was called the Shoot the Shoots, uh, which was an early log flume. And the gentleman who uh, invented that ride also did uh, water acrobatic shows. And he dived off a 103 foot tower into the lagoon. And he had a pet that always found him at the bottom when he landed into the water. So you're, um, what you need to be thinking about for the next half hour or so is what pet did he have that he always met when he actually hit the water? So um, we'll get to that soon. Let me see, you all don't wanna be looking at my face all day. So if this works, and it should, let's see. Okay, so can you see the screen with just the one photo on it? We see the one photo and then on the side, it does show next slide. Okay, so we need the full. I'm not sure why it's only giving me. Still doing it? It is, but it's pretty good size. There we go. Now are you seeing the one picture? Yes, that's perfect. Okay. So this is the lagoon, and if you look at it closely, you can see in the back, so you see the round building. Um, in the, if you look at the right-hand side of the, um, of the slide, you're gonna see kind of a round-shaped building, which was an amphitheater. Behind it, in the background, you're gonna see a church with a steeple. That's St. Boniface Church facing Adelia Street. So just to kind of give you an, a, a point of view of where we're located here, we're on the west side of Ludlow between Ludlow and Bromley, and that's where, that's where the, um, the park existed. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the rides and, and why it became to be. Um, I love this shot because it, it really does give you a, a good view of the major attractions, including the, the roller coaster, which is in the front there. Behind it, you can kind of see a slide, which is the shoot the shoots. You can see um, the theater, you can see the amphitheater, and you can see the boathouse. You can also, if you look really close, you can see the entrance pavilion to the left, and you can see um, the clubhouse, just a little bit of the clubhouse further to your left. 
but I'm going to start as to why. This is Elm Street, and Elm Street in Ludlow is Route 8. So if you're following the river along Route 8 in Northern Kentucky, you go right down Elm Street. This is the streetcar tracks. And this is really why um, the lagoon exists or existed um, for when it did exist. Um, this is um, the, the streetcar came through Lalo in 1894. Um, and it was built basically to get people from Lalo into Covington to downtown Cincinnati to work. But what the, the owners of the streetcar system wanted to do was to uh, make money on the weekends as well. So they were, making, they were making money during the weekdays, getting people back and forth to work, just like Tank does. Um, what they were trying to do is to build attractions at the end of each line. And so at the end of the Bellevue, Newport Bellevue date line was Tacoma Park and the beaches. At the end of the Fort Thomas line was the fort. At the end of the Fort Mitchell line was uh, what became the Greyhound Grill uh, and that little entertainment district. At the end of the Ludlow Bromley line, there really was nothing. Uh, and so the, the owners of the streetcar company, it was privately owned, were looking for something to put at the end of the streetcar line. So the streetcar line comes through in 1894, um, which is rapid transit into Ludlow. This is, this is looking west towards um, Bromley in this photo. Uh, and what they discovered is, if you look at this map, you'll see the pink area is Ludlow. Um, and then you see Bromley a little bit to the left. And you can see a little line that's marked Pleasant Run Creek. Pleasant Run Creek is the key to the lagoon. So the creek there is um, still there, it's still called the Pleasant Run, um, and it divides Ludlow and Bromley. So it's kind of the official border between the two cities. In 1883, 1884, there were, th th uh, actually 1882, 83, 84, there were three major floods in Northern Kentucky and water backed up from the river into this valley along the Pleasant Run Creek and it formed a lake, a temporary lake. And so in 1894, when they put the streetcar tracks through, they decided, why don't we just make a permanent lake? So they built a dam. So you can see where the creek kind of enters um, off of the Ohio River there on the left. They built a dam and uh, basically where Oak Street is today. So a little bit further um, in from Elm. So um, Oak is the second street up from the river in the west end of Ludlow. They built the dam and uh, they made this artificial lake. Now the amusement park was meant to be surrounded by the lake. The lake was the feature. Um, and if you look at this map, if you see the dark line that winds its way around what is Route 8 now, the, the part marked West Covington, a little bit north of it, is um, the east end of Ludlow. The dark part down the middle is the railroad. So if you see the, the darker line that's kind of snaking its way through, that is the path that the streetcar line took. So it's taking its way. It goes down to Elm at Adela or Adelia. We all call it Adelia in Ludlow, although it's spelled Adela. It makes a little curve, goes down Oak. It's wrapping around. Uh, it crosses over at Laurel and then goes down to Park and returns. So at that junction between on Laurel Street between Park and Lake was the, the entrance to the park. So that's where people got off the trolley and they went into the park. The park had one admittance fee and then you paid for everything else according to what you do. So it wasn't like Kings Island where you paid one fee and you could ride all the rides. You paid the fee to get in and then you paid a fee to do whatever else you wanted to do. So each ride was separate. So you could pick and choose. The lake was over 80 acres. So it was a very large lake. Um, it had five islands on it by the time it was finished. Uh, and we have some photos from as late as the 1950s where you can see some of the islands that are still popping up. Um, by the time I was a kid in the 70s, um, we were basically ice skating on what was left of the lake. There wasn't much of a lake left, but there was still the outline of it there, or at least part of it. So um, the interesting thing too about the park when they decided to build this amusement park was the owners were actually also, the stockholders were actually the stockholders of the streetcar line. So not only did they own the, the, the transportation to get to the park, 
they also own the park. So they were getting profits for you to get there. They were getting the profits for you when you were, when you were at the park and they got the profits when you went home. So this was a business venture for this group of fairly prominent men in Northern Kentucky from Campbell and Kenton County who owned the park and the street railway company. Well, doesn't seem to want to let me go. There we go. Okay, so here's the park again, uh, another view. You can see uh, again where we are. If you look to the, on the right-hand side um, to the far, um, the, the bridge going across is the trestle. So it's the Southern Railroad trestle. It's the second trestle, it's still there. When you come into Ludlow, um, you're, going, uh, you're going down Sleepy Hollow, you go under the trestle you, and you get into Devil Street. So that's approximately where we are. Um, if you look behind these major buildings here and behind the rides, basically would be what today is Sleepy Hollow and Devil Street. The mound there is um, Pigeon Point um, behind the trestle, which gets its top chopped off in the 40s to build a flood wall in Covington. But I think this photo is good because it shows a really interesting thing about the park. It was really built around the lake. The lake was the main attraction. In the 1890s, one thing that people didn't have in anywhere basically was uh, reliable air conditioning of any kind. And so you know how hot it gets in summers in Northern Kentucky. And so people were looking for ways to cool off. They were looking for ways to entertain themselves and a lake seemed to, to make sense. And so the lake was always the, um, the main attraction. It was surrounded by walking paths and originally it was surrounded by gas lights that eventually were um, uh, made into electric when electric was extended from Ludlow down to the park. So uh, you can imagine at night, this was a, a really beautiful scene uh, walking around um, the, the lagoon. Also there is, and the newspapers make this very clear, um, that young people particularly liked the path around the park, especially at night, because this is the Victorian era and it was socially acceptable to be at a park with a friend. <laughs> and so this was a way of courting. So there was a lot of courting done here. Uh, my grandparents actually met at the park um, and later married on uh, my mother's side. So this is where my, my grandparents, so I am a child of the Lolo Lagoon, or a grandchild, I guess, of the Lolo Lagoon, I should say. Um, but you'll see there's, on all these photos, there's boats. Um, you can rent anything from a small canoe, and you'll see there's a canoe in this picture, two electric launches. Uh, the park was built on a similar um, idea of the Columbian Exposition that happened in Chicago in 1893. It was the 400th anniversary of, of the discovery of the Americas. Uh, and they did this large um, festival, an international festival in Chicago. Uh, the owners of the lagoon went to Chicago and, um, and found a lot of the ideas and brought them back. They, act they actually brought back some of the boats. So that electric launch, which is the main boat in the foreground, was actually bought from the Chicago World's Fair and brought to Ludlow. I think they bought six or eight of them at one time and transported them to Ludlow. Uh, and when we get to another part, I'll tell you some other um, examples of how the Chicago World's Fair impacted um, the lagoon. The building to the far right, the small building that's brown, um, that looks like there's a water spout coming out of it, which is basically a fountain behind it. That is the boathouse. And I'll show you a picture of it later, but that's where you would go to catch boats. You could rent a boat or you could get on a boat and take a tour. So you had multiple options. Um, this is the main pavilion, the entry pavilion that we talked about. Um, and oops. Uh, at the bottom. So when you got off on Laurel Street, you can see the railroad, or you can see the um, streetcar lines in front of the building. Um, and you can see uh, the basic theme of the architecture of the, the buildings. They had this kind of castle kind of theme going. The building um, to the upper right, or upper left, sorry, is the back of the clubhouse. The clubhouse still stands. If you're going down Laurel Street and you run into Lake Street, you will see the clubhouse. 
Um, this is the back of the clubhouse. The front, I'll show you a little bit later on. It's one of three structures that still remains, and I'll tell you why that's important when we get further on in my talk about how we use those three structures to figure out where things actually were at the park. Um, the top picture is the boathouse, so you can see that's where you would go um, to, um, to catch a boat, to rent a boat, um, and um, that was a very popular attraction. Um, I have found at least eight people um, who drowned at the lagoon during its uh, brief tenure. So there is, there are stories of, um, of people capsizing and those kinds of things. There's also one tragic event we'll talk about in a, later on that um, brought somewhat a demise to the park. Uh, the bottom picture is the beach which I find interesting. They called it the bathing beach. It doesn't look like much of a beach, but you can see um, the, the two boys at least are wearing swimsuits um, that were popular in the day. Those would have been wool, by the way. So uh, you can imagine um, swimming in a wool swimsuit, um, which is basically full body. Um, uh, young boys and men could wear, they could, sh they could um, show basically from the knee down. Women were not even given that luxury. And so women were basically covered from neck to ankle in some kind of clothing when they were, when they were swimming in the lake. Um, so um, you can imagine, e e even when it was hot, that was still a better option for them than staying at home in, um, you know, in crowded conditions. Um, people were coming to the park in very large numbers. There were, there were records of 50 to 60,000 people on a weekend. There were um, trolley cars leaving um, Fountain Square, uh, marked the lagoon every five minutes in the summer um, uh, in the evenings when the lagoon was open. So there was a constant traffic going back and forth between Cincinnati, Covington, Newport, Bellevue, Dayton to the lagoon. It was a major attraction. Um, it existed at the same time as Chester Park in Cincinnati and Coney Island for a while. And so it was a um, competitor of those two and actually drew larger crowds in many occasions um, than um, the other two parks. So um, it, it did quite well for a long period of time. Um, you'll also notice um, when you look at the photographs, I think it's interesting to look at the styles of the, of the clothing the women are wearing. You see um, the women um, in the background are wearing, sitting against the wall, their hats. They're wearing the large hats. You'll see lots of people uh, with umbrellas to shade themselves, not necessarily for the for rain, but to, to basically shade themselves from the sun. Well, I am not sure. Oh. We got somebody trying to get in, that's why. Okay, there's another picture of the boathouse. So you'll see the oarsmen there. Um, they, you, could, uh, you could rent a boat and they would take you out or you could rent one of these boats and you could go out on your own. If you look really closely, you can see a swan boat in the background. Um, so the, the old pedal, you know, the, where you sit in a boat and you pedal. If you look in the background towards the fence, you can see a long swan's neck sticking up. So um, again, just another example of, of, of something that attracted people to the lake. Um, the, the boats that took you on tours actually stopped at some of the islands. One of the islands contained the Ferris wheel of the lagoon. The Ferris wheel was bought from the Columbian Exposition in Chicago when it closed and it was transported to the lagoon and set up on one of the islands. So not only did you have to pay to ride the Ferris wheel, but you had to pay to get on the boat to get to the island to get to the Ferris wheel. So uh, the guys that own the park knew how to make money. Uh, here's one of those electric launches we talked about. So um, this was a novelty for the time. So these are uh, folks, again, who are going out on a guided tour. You can see the younger boys in the front, um, and you can see the ladies with their hats and the gentlemen uh, wearing some bowlers. Um, you can also see in the background um, the, um, the Scenic Railway. Now the Scenic Railway is a very early version of a roller coaster. Um, and the Scenic Railway was, um, a, a began to be built, Scenic Railways began to be built in the 1880s. The first one was built at Coney Island in New, York's, uh, New York City. 
1884, LaMarcus Thompson uh, built the first real roller coaster, or what we would call a roller coaster, at Coney Island. He was um, asked by the owners of the lagoon to build the Lagoon Scenic Railway, or the Lagoon Roller Coaster. And so uh, LaMarcus Thompson, um, the, the founder of modern roller coasters, built Lala Lagoon's roller coaster. So the roller coaster um, was cutting edge at the time. You actually climbed a tower, you got into a car, you actually, um, you sat uh, sideways. So you didn't sit going facing forward, you sat sideways with your back to the person behind you in the earliest versions. Uh, the earliest versions you got on a, it was gravity fed. So you went down the, you went down the, um, the scenic railway or the roller coaster. When you got to the end, you had to get off, climb another tower, and then get back on for the return trip. What Marcus did was called, um, uh, what Marcus Thompson did was uh, he came up with what was called the switchback uh, roller coaster. And he put a, uh, a tunnel at the end with a corkscrew. So when the gravity and eventually electric propelled you to the end, you went into a tunnel, an indoor tunnel, you did multiple loops inside, and then you shot out into the light. So the interior of that corkscrew usually was painted with scenes. For, for a number of years, it had Civil War scenes. Um, for a number of years, it had the four seasons because it had four levels, so each level was a different season. So they kind of changed it up as time went on. But uh, this was the most popular attraction um, at the lagoon. Uh, it was five cents to ride in 1895 when it opened, uh, which was a considerable, considerable amount of money at the time. Um, and it was, again, it drew people from throughout the Midwest. Uh, it was one of the few west of New York City when it was built. It was uh, a main attraction. The other thing that was very important about it was so um, not sure what that noise was, but anyway, it was built over the lake. I'm getting feedback from somewhere. Um, it was built over the lake, um, and so when you were on the car, you were almost like you were floating over the lake. Someone's not on mute. Yes, that has to be it. Um, so that's the scenic railway. They called it the scenic railway. We refer to it today as the roller coaster. And if you look above it and behind it, you can see the trestle. So again, it kind of puts it into perspective as to where we are. D uh, Sleepy Hollow would run right underneath that trestle. This is the uh, Ferris wheel. So the Ferris wheel at the park um, was built in the, um, in the uh, late 1890s. Uh, this is an exterior shot. I'll show you an exterior shot in a minute. It was lit by electric and you'll see it says electric merry-go-round. Electricity was a huge component of the success of the lagoon because it was one of the few places that, um, that was predominantly um, powered by electricity. And so you could go to the lagoon and see all these marvels of electricity. They even had an exhibit called Edison, the Edisonia exhibit, which included all, uh, uh, lots of Edison's um, inventions. So you could go into an exhibit hall and you could see all the inventions that Edison had come up with, including um, you know, his, his pushing forward electricity and the use of electricity. So uh, a lot of the rides uh, were gas lit originally, but quickly turned into electric. Um, the the, the um, carousel was one of them. This is the exterior. This is the interior. So you see uh, we have horses, we have lions. Um, what I would love to do is define, and you can see the light bulbs. If you look at the beam that's going across the top, you can see a light bulb hanging down. So you can see the inside of this thing was lit up. Um, we don't know what happened to this ride when it closed. Um, I would love, I would give an eye tooth to find one of those horses or one of those lions. They have to exist somewhere because they were all hand carved in Europe. So this was a very expensive ride. Um, and certainly when the park closed, it was sold to some, some other park. We just don't know where. So I'm always looking for what happened to this ride. And if anybody ever finds out, call me because I really want to know. 
this is the uh, miniature railroad. Ludlow was a huge railroad town. The railroad came to Ludlow in the 1870s. Um, and uh, the Ludlow family gave the city, gave the railroad the right of way through Ludlow and the, it still follows that path. Um, and so, and, and Northern Kentucky, of course, had the LNN, the CNO, and the Southern. The Southern was the one, the railroad that came through Ludlow. So railroads were very popular. This railroad was built in um, 1909, and it was three-fourths of a mile, and it went around part of the, uh, part of the, uh, the lake. Um, the other thing I really like about it is, again, you can see above it, you can see the electric lighting. So you can see how they were surrounding the entire lake with a light, with a halo of electricity. And you can imagine at a time when electricity was still rare, you would come to this huge lake and it had this electric halo around it at night. And it kept people there at dark. It's kind of like the Disneyland parade, you know, when they do in the dark. You know, they, you know, it's trying to keep people longer to spend more money. Well, this is what they were doing 100 years ago as well. It also gives you a really good shot of the people on the scenic railway. So you can see one of the cars going and you can see the tunnel at the end that's built over the lake. So the, the, the cars go in that tunnel, do a three cork, corkscrew loop and then shoot out the other end and come back. So it's a nice picture that shows various, um, angles of the park. Um, another view of the Scenic Railroad and some boats. Again, you can see one of the cars at the, at the uh, beginning. And you can see, again, approximately where we are. Fortunately, the railroad is giving us some clues about where we were located. Uh, and again, you can see that halo that's kind of going around the park's edge. By the way, right behind, right above this, um, the vessel there um, is a, a battery. We, we, you hear of Hooper battery and Bates battery and those batteries that were built during the Civil War to protect Cincinnati. There was one right beyond, the first one on the Kentucky side is on the other side of that railroad track and it's still there. Um, there's not much of it left, um, but I can remember as a kid still seeing the indention uh, and still seeing that. So certainly in the 1890s and the early 1900s, that fortification would have had some significance to people going to the park because it was a very quick walk to get there. This is another ride um, that was very successful. It was built by Paul Boynton. Uh, Boynton again had a connection with uh, Coney Island. Um, he was the gentleman that started the acrobatic, the water acrobatic shows. He also developed a ride called the Shoot the Shoots. So you shoot the shoots. Uh, it's this long um, slide, basically. Um, you could kind of call it uh, one of the original log flumes. So you would climb the tower, you would get onto the top. There were flat bottom boats that actually were let loose. You went down the slide, you hit the, you hit the water and you skidded a bit across the lake. You were pulled back and that was the end of the ride. Uh, interestingly enough, it was so popular and this is one of my treasures from the lagoon. I, I don't know if you're, you can probably see it. Um, this is one of the passes. So this was a, um, an annual pass. So when you, when you bought an annual pass for the lagoon, it was just like buying an annual pass at, Coney, at Kings Island. You could buy a season ticket. This was a season ticket from 1896, so the second year, and it's signed by the, um, the gentleman, J.J. Weaver, who was the, um, uh, he was one of the um, owners, and it's also signed by J.J. Noonan, who was the president. Um, and it's J.J. Weaver and Lady, so um, he was able to bring his guest with him. But um, it's, it's ticket number, let's see. 2,480, so um, you can see how popular the park actually was. But again, it has that picture of the, um, the shoot the shoots on it. One of the problems, one of the problems with the shoots the shoots was um, it, it had, a, it had a, a bit of a dip at the end that kind of forced the boat to kind of go up and skid across the water. And that was supposed to make it a little bit more exciting. What it actually did was make it a little bit more dangerous. <laughs> uh, and so this ride only lasted for about five to six years. So when you're looking at photos of the lagoon, you can usually date it 
by whether the shoots the shoots is there in the picture or not. So between 18, um, it was built in, um, I believe, 18, yeah, 1896, and it lasted for about six years. So if it's in the picture, it's somewhere between 1896 and 1904, give or take. If it's, if it's not in the photo, then it's probably after that. Um, but uh, again, it was an attraction that um, drew people from all over. Uh, not one of the other attractions, uh, air balloons became really popular during the Civil War and um, they became popular at the Lagoon Amusement Park as well. So you could actually, um, you could pay to go up into the lagoon and we have some aerial shots of the lagoon that actually were taken from this balloon. So some of the best photos we have of the park are actually taken from the balloon. So um, it served two purposes. It, it was used to um, take photographs for uh, merchandising and for advertising and it was also a ride. Uh, basically it was tied down so you got on it, you went up and then they pulled you back down. Uh, there were on at least two occasions when it, it broke loose. Um, one time it was brought down in Price Hill. So people got a lot more than they paid for. <laughs> and one time it got blown down, uh, down river and it ended up on the Villa Madonna Academy property in Villa Hill. So you can imagine getting on um, the balloon in Price Hill and, or in Ludlow and ending up in Price Hill. But um, it, it happened at least twice. Um, it was a very popular ride again. And when you think about it, this is before, you know, flight. This is before people had bird's eye views of anything unless you went up into a, a high building. And even high buildings at this time were rare in this area. So um, this was an attraction that um, drew lots and lots of people. And again, the, the photos of the ladies in their hats, the little boy in the front, um, the, the gentlemen in their bowlers, and look, they're wearing suit jackets. This is the middle of the summer. You know, everybody's dressing up to go to the park and it's probably 95 degrees or 90 degrees outside, but that's what, that's what they did at that time period. The Midway was something they also got from the Columbian Exposition. Um, early amusement parks tended to be, if you wanted food, you brought your own food. The Columbian Exposition, uh, other not, otherwise known as the Chicago World's Fair, um, started what they called the Midway. So they set up an area of the park that had food, and they also, uh, in this area of the park, had games of chance. So it was, way, it was a way of making more money, and it was a way of keeping people longer at the park. And you didn't have to bring your own food. So uh, it was kind of a win-win for everybody. Um, these young ladies are, are selling French hot waffles, two for five cents. Um, these gentlemen are doing a ring toss. And if you look really closely, there's a lot of interesting things. If you see, they're holding these sticks and there's rings on the sticks. So that's what all those little ridges are. And if you look at the, uh, the gentleman on the right, you can kind of see that they're actual rings. Now, if you really, if you're looking at this photograph um, very closely, the things that are sticking up that you're throwing the ring around are knives. So they're either knives that are stuck into the wood or they're switch blades that are stuck into the wood. So if you got the ring around the knife handle, you won the knife. Now, if you look really close in the front row, there are five pistols. Uh, they're on their back, so the, the butt of the pistol is sticking up. If you got the ring around the butt of the pistol, you actually won the pistol. Now to tell you how much things have changed, if you won a knife or a pistol at the lagoon during this time period, you just walked away with it. Nobody took it away from you. You didn't have to you know, put it aside and pick it up at the end of the day. Times were different. So again, the, the ring toss idea that we do now over milk bottles or whatever, this has been going on for a hundred years or more. Uh, and so these gentlemen uh, rented space and set up shop and this is how they made their money over, over the summer. So there were all kinds of these things uh, along the Midway, by the way. Um, so you could get um, anything from pretzels to beer to uh, sausages to playing games of chance to waffles to um, 
the uh, they had ring toss. They had um, there was another game that was very popular during that time period. It's escaping me, but anyway, this was a whole area on the map, and I'll sh I'll show you a map later on um, where we know what existed and when. Okay, this is a uh, another thing that uh, another ride that attracted people to the lagoon on a regular basis. This is the area, uh, automobile aerial road. Um, it was basically full size Buick touring cars. So these are Buick cars, they're full size cars that you would ride on the streets. They built elevated tracks through the woods north of the park. So this would be. Um, in the area where the swim club is, the Lola Brownlee Swim Club, um, over in that area in the Wooded Hills area of the park. Uh, and so you would get in a car and you could drive this car on this track up through the treetops. And the, uh, some of the postcards call it a ride through the treetops. I think the interesting thing about it is the technology. Uh, if you look down the middle of the track, there's this metal bar. See the metal bar right, the, right underneath the, the car and it's continuing down the track. It's the same metal bar you see on rides at Kings Island today. When you get on the Tin Lizzie, the Tin Lizzie cars at, um, at uh, Kings Island, there's that metal bar that keeps the car from going off the track. Well, same technology they were using in 1909 when they built the automobile aerial ride. Uh, and a lot of the photos that we have of this ride, their their women typically are driving the car and the men are riding in the car. We think that's because it was con it was still in the early 1900s uh, considered to be, hmm, you know, women didn't typically drive as much during that time period. And so this was a chance for women to drive and uh, men to ride. And so it's very interesting when you see a lot of these photos that the women are, are driving and not the men. Um, here's a good example. So there's three lovely ladies and one uh, some very stern looking gentleman in car number four. And if you look, you can see the bar going down the middle and the, the um, the apparatus on the bottom of the car that's keeping it on track. So no matter what you did, it was gonna be very difficult for you to drive this thing off the track. So it was a pretty safe ride. Uh, as far as I know, there were no accidents, but it gave you that sensation of being able to drive a car and doing it uh, on an elevated track, which was certainly unusual. Um, this was, a, this was um, um, advertised as a one of a kind, that there was no other park in the country that had an, an, an automobile aerial ride. Um, the track you can see in the foreground here, and you can see one of the cars on the left-hand side. Behind it is another attraction that was very popular. Uh, the building that has the unusual roof line was the Fair Japan. Uh, Russia and Japan went to war in 1904, and it was assumed that Russia would win this war. It was a naval battle because Russia was a European power, Japan was an Asian power, um, most people felt that the European power would prevail very easily. And so everybody was expecting Russia to win this war. Well, it turns out very quickly, the Japanese defeated the Russian um, Navy very quickly. And everything Japanese became very popular um, in, uh, in the West, and particularly in the United States. So. Um, a, a, a Jap a, a Japanese culture became very um, predominant or uh, uh, fashionable in the United States during this time, 1904. And so they built this Japanese tea house. They brought over uh, Japanese women to serve tea in traditional Japanese attire. They had a jujitsu instructor, instructor come over and teach people um, the martial arts, which was unheard of during this time period. Uh, again, it was, it's a good example of the owners of the lagoon looking at current events and parlaying in that as, into a new attraction. In 1898-1899, uh, during the uh, Spanish-American War, uh, they actually brought a Cuban refugee family to the park. They put them on one of the islands and built them what they considered to be a Cuban hut. They put some animals out there. The family actually lived on this island the whole summer. It was a mother, a father, and five children. Uh, the park paid for them to live there, and people got on boats, 
paid to go out to the island and see how this family would have lived in Cuba. So it's kind of a living history kind of thing, but also kind of a weird kind of culturally strange thing. But in, you know, during this time period, during the Spanish-American War, uh, people were very interested in Cuba. And so again, it was a way of, of tying current events into the park and making it relevant and making it different. So every year they were adding a different attraction, just like they do um, at, um, at Kings Island. You know, there's a new attraction every year. Well, we're the, not keeping our distance. We have our masks. We're not open to the public. Okay. Sorry. Somebody needs to turn off there. There you go. There you go. Okay. Um, so every year they, they tended to add something different to the park just to, you know, so when people came, they would see um, something new. Hey, Dave. Yes. Um, we are at about 15 minutes out okay. at the end. So I just want to give you that warning. Gotcha. We want to have time for a couple up. questions. Sorry. Yeah. Um, here's another, just a fun picture of the park. Um, these are one of those old hand tinted postcards. Uh, this is one of the things that brought the park to, the cl to a close. This is the motor drone. Um, it was built in 1913 and it was built for motorcycle racing. So you can see Goodyear is the sponsor if you're looking closely. It is a saucer built on, on an angle. Um, it was a, um, it was built um, basically um, out of wood. So this is a wood structure. Uh, it has electric and gas lighting around it. The gas lighting is important to, to the story. You can see the lamps surrounding it. If you look really close below the lamps, you're going to see some mesh that runs along the first set of chairs, the first set of bleachers. So on July 30th, 1913, there's a race. There's 5,000 people sitting in the stands just in this event alone. Uh, you can see the, in the, in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see that mesh barrier as well. So um, there was a gentleman here uh, who came, who his name was Odin Johnson. He was kind of one of the characters on the motorcycle circuit. So when you think of the NASCAR circuit, there was a motorcycle circuit during this time period. They were going from city to city and racing. And so they raced on this track that was at an angle. So um, it was, um, and it was a wood track with wood stands. Odin Johnson um, is in the lead um, and he has five other riders following him. So there's six motorcycles on this track and there's 5,000 people watching. Um, he hits that wire mesh barrier and the mesh barrier does its job, it keeps the motor, Johnson's motorcycle from going into the stands. Unfortunately, where he hits the mesh is where one of those lamp posts are. The lamp posts, posts collapse into the stands. It throws burning oil into the stands and the stands and the track catch on fire. Uh, and so you can imagine the panic caused, um, there's 5,000 people sitting in these stands and people are running everywhere trying to get out of the motor drum. Um, by the end of the night, we know that at least um, 10 people um, die, including Odin Johnson, the, the motorcycle uh, rider. Um, this, the youngest death uh, was a, a, a small Lala boy by the name of um, Charles Davis. He was five years old, so he was the youngest. Um, there were a mother and daughter who died. Uh, most of the people were sitting in the front rows. The local newspapers did a pretty good job of, um, you can see the, the, here's the angel of death. He's stirring the motor drum up with his fork and the people are hanging off of it. Um, he's got his bottle marked speed madness. So um, this was a, um, this was in the Kentucky Post actually. So this is from the Kentucky Post. This is Charles Davis. He was the five-year-old boy. Uh, on his death certificate, which is actually right here, it says he died on July 31, 1913. And the cause of death is on the right-hand side about halfway down. It says motorcycle accident, uh, extensive burns, gasoline explosion. So that was his cause of death. He's buried in Highland Cemetery. So um, he's, he's um, still there. And you can see his occupation is listed, listed as schoolboy. So he was a, probably kindergarten, first grade. 
Um, here's another um, political or a uh, editorial cartoon that was in the Kentucky Post. The, the race is resumed and the, th and the track was rebuilt very quickly, uh, but it was also, the park was sued extensively over this accident. Um, and so that caused some problems. The same year, there's a major flood in greater Cincinnati, 1913, which did extensive damage to the park. Uh, and two years later in 1915, there is a tornado that sweeps through Northern Kentucky, took out steeples on just about every church and building from Ludlow all the way into Bellevue and Dayton. So um, when steeples start disappearing from churches, I can almost tell you it's about 1915 because the 1915 tornado um, did a number on a lot of churches. This is the motor drone, so you can see where the, the tornado went through. You can also see the roller coaster, and you can see the, the spiral loop at the end there uh, in the back on the right upper hand side. Um, more tornado damage. That is the dance pavilion, by the way. So there's a bar on the first floor, and the second floor was a dance pavilion. Lalo also had one of the first moving picture shows um, in Greater Cincinnati at the park. This is more tornado damage. But what really brings an end to the park is World War I. Uh, 1917, the US enters the war. Um, prohibition does not officially start till 1920 as a national movement. But in 1917, when we started sending troops abroad, um, there was a temporary prohibition for, for, from 1917 and 1918 that limited grain usage to make alcohol because the grain was being sent to Europe uh, to feed our, our boys and also to feed um, our European allies. And so beer production in 1917 and 1918 dropped dramatically. There were no beer, very few beer sales in 1917 and there were none in 1918. The park immediately comes to a halt uh, in 1918. And so there, um, that is the last season. Actually, the, the, the inability to sell beer is what really is the death knell of the park. Um, here's some few things that survive. This is the clubhouse. So if you go down Laurel into um, Lake Street, that's what the front of the clubhouse looks like today. That's still there. This is the caretaker's house, which is at the corner of Deverell and Lake. So Lake does a loop and connects back into Deverell. Uh, this house still stands. It was the caretaker's lot. You can see that in the top picture, you can see the, the, tear, the caretaker, his wife, and their small child. And the bottom pictures are more modern photos. So you can see the building is, rare, is, is almost identical. The only difference really is that the uh, additions of the shutters, uh, even the bric-a-brac, the, the Victorian um, trim is still intact. And the roof, the roof line, uh, which is very distinctive. This is one other piece that still survives in some homes behind the houses that are on Lake Street. We played on these steps as children, and so I always knew this was part of the park. Uh, we did some investigative work with the Lalo Historical Society, and so we knew where those steps were, we knew where the clubhouse was, and we knew where the caretaker's house was. So if you see the yellow houses um, on the left-hand side, you can see on the, the part jutting out into the lake, that is the clubhouse. Further back is the caretaker's house. And then on the side of the amphitheater um, are those steps. So using GSI mapping through, the, um, through PDS and using an insurance map that we have at the Kenton County Library in Covington from 1909, we were able to overlap the two maps so we know exactly where everything is. We knew exactly where everything was. So on the right hand side, you can see the trestle. You can see Sleepy Hollow is going right through the middle of the park. We always thought the park was further in, uh, into where the lake is. You can see where Carlisle Field is. It's right where the scenic railroad goes over. So when you're going down Sleepy Hollow and you see the baseball park, you can see it. It's, we left it on the map. Andy Korn, who is a local architect, lives in Ludlow, did a lot of this work. Andy, is, is, he can take you at, on a tour through the park um, using the, these two maps. It's, it's wonderful. This is just one little piece. You can also see in the upper, upper right-hand corner of the Ludlow Bromley Swim Club. 
Um, so this area is, was all part of the park. You can see where it has now become predominantly um, uh, residential. My house is one of these houses on this map. Uh, when I pay my taxes every year, it says Ludlow Lagoon Land Edition number one lot, and I'm not telling you the lot number, but uh, <laughs> that's what this, that's what this um, particular um, subdivision is called, the, the Lagoon Land Edition. So that's where I leave off, and that's where you can ask questions. Great. Well, that was fascinating, and I love seeing those pictures, Dave, and I especially love this map. I feel like I want to take it with me and go and go explore, and someone on the call actually had an idea of doing some kind of walking tour, which I think is an awesome idea, so maybe the museum and the library can partner on that. I, th I think that would be very cool. That could be very cool. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that we got um, that I actually was going to ask you myself, so we'll start with that one, was yeah. how, do we have any idea how deep the water was in the lagoon? Um, the, the stories that I've uh, been able to find in newspaper articles said that in some places it was 35 feet deep. Oh, wow. In some places you could wade in it. So okay. it depends on where you were in the lake, but sure. yeah, it was, it was fairly deep in, in several places. Uh, women falling out of boats was one of the causes of some of those deaths I talked about. Because you can imagine, you saw the way those women were dressed. Yeah. If you fell out of a boat into water and got waterlogged, it just pulled you directly under. Oh, no. Uh, and so, um, yes, unfortunately, um, there are a lot of um, articles, not a lot of articles, but a significant number of articles that deal with drownings or near drownings um, at the lake. Wow. Um, so as far as the park itself, was it yeah. open like all week long and was it open ever in the winter or did it have a more of a season? It had a season like the lagoon. So it usually opened in April and usually shut down sometime in September or if they could push it to October. So, um, it had a season, um, usually when it was warm. Uh, and then, uh, in the winter people would sneak in and ice skate. Um, and long after the park was closed in 1918, people were ice skating on that lake. Um, dad, my dad, who would be 89, he would have been 90 this year, actually. Um, he remembers ice skating down there. I ice skated down there in the 70s, so. That's really cool. Yes. Um, someone asked, was the lagoon an immediate hit or did it take a while to gain popularity? It was almost immediate. Um, once they started putting those rides in, so 1894 was when the lake was built. By the time the rides were put in in 1895, the park was, um, was doing very well. And it was financially successful up until about the last five years when the, between the, the motor drone accident and being sued, the 1915 tornado, the 1913 flood, and then prohibition. So it, it had four whammies all within about five years. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, and then somebody else asking, I think you might have answered this, but just to clarify, someone asked where the Midway was. And so um, I had a question of, would it be okay if we um, maybe pulled that slide up again while I read um, yeah. the guesses that everyone came up with for the quiz? Okay. So um, this is a creative bunch, apparently. <laughs> so we have the following guesses, and I think they're worth reading, and then, um, and then you can tell us the answer. So okay. just as a reminder for those that join late, the quiz was it regarding a high jumper, right, Dave? Yes. And someone who jumped over 100 feet, is that right, into the yes. water? Yes. And this person had a, like a best friend pet that would always meet him at the, at the bottom. Correct. And so we have the following guesses, dog, horse, duck, goat, cat, otter, donkey, raccoon, and bear. None are correct. No? What was it? Think of something in the South and think of something that was water related that would be an attraction that would that would make people that was exotic. Like a manatee? <laughs> You're getting closer. Think Florida, Louisiana. An alligator? An alligator. He had a pet alligator. 
And when he, his, <laughs> the gentleman's name was McGee, and Mr. McGee jumped one time. He, he did a flip. He landed wrong on his back and knocked himself out. They rolled him over the barrel, they called it in the newspaper. And it took me a while to figure out what that meant. They actually physically took him onto the shore. They, they dove in, found the body, pulled him out, put him over a barrel, and rolled the barrel back and forth to get the water out of his lungs. That's what they were doing. It took a while for me to figure out, what are you talking about rolling this man over? He's, you know, he's dying and you're rolling him over a barrel. But it makes perfect sense now. He did survive. Uh, it took three days to find the alligator, though. It was a full-size alligator that roamed the lake for three days. And as good businessmen always do, the owners of the lagoon took out ads in the newspaper immediately saying anyone who could spot the alligator would win a prize. That's amazing. Um, Lori Rich would like to know if that is related to the alligator that escaped in Prisoner's Lake. No. <laughs> No, that was a later time. That was a later alligator. <laughs> yes. yes, that is. Uh, and you need to ask Rick Robinson about that alligator. Yes. Well, I am seeing here that <laughs> William Schultz and Lee Burkett must have, right before we said the, the answer, yes. uh, guessed crocodile and alligator. So we will work on getting um, each of you. Um, here, I'm just going to write the names down here. Each of you, a something from the museum to say thanks for playing our prize, uh, playing our quiz, rather. Yeah, so, can I say one, one more thing? Yes, absolutely. One of the things that I'm most proud of is sitting behind me. Um, if, if you all have ever um, gone to the Behringer Crawford, they have a fundraiser where they give away the two-headed calf award. Uh, and they give away four of them every year. One is for history, and I won one one year. So this is one of my things that I keep on my uh, little desk behind me over there with my awards. But uh, it's a, a great way to support the library, or the library. It's a great way to support the museum. Uh, <laughs> it's, their, it's one of their major fundraisers during the year, and so I highly recommend. It's a good time. They have an auction. They do lots of good things, and it's a great way to support um the local history efforts of the museum and the museum staff oh thank you dave it is a wonderful event we're working on figuring out what it's going to look like in 2020 because yeah. it's typically a spring event um but hopefully by 2021 we will be back on track with an in-person so and you too can win a two-headed calf award yeah. it's on my resume it's the most colorful thing on my resume that is awesome. Well, we, um, we are so appreciative of everything that you have uh, done for the history community in Northern Kentucky, that is for sure. Um, I do want to ask you, I know we're a little bit over on time, but do you have any upcoming projects that you want to share with the group? Uh, the latest thing I did with Bob Schroggy, and Bob is actually on here. I see Bob. Yeah. He's I'm just staring right at him. As he does. <laughs> but uh, Bob and I wrote a book called Lost Northern Kentucky, which is about um, buildings that we have lost. So there's a chap there's a section in there on the lagoon, but there's lots of different um, things in Northern Kentucky that unfortunately have not survived to the present. So. Um, that was my latest thing. I'm working um, with Dr. Paul Tencotti, who is uh, with the um, Public History Program and the History Department at NKU uh, on a project uh, of historic churches in Northern Kentucky right now. Oh, so great. that'll be, that's my next project. I've always got something in the, um, in the works. Yeah, well, we'll look forward to seeing that when it comes out and maybe we'll have you back and you all can talk about sure. that. Um, meanwhile, um, I do have a couple of things just to add for those that are left with us. Um, thank you again, everybody, for joining. Um, we're going to do this weekly, and as Dave mentioned, Bob Shroggy is um, going to be our guest next week, and he is going to be talking about his new book, Legendary Locals of Covington. So um, we also plan, though, we have a um, Newport, um, Campbell County guest, um, it lined up, um, not quite ready to announce yet, um, <laughs> who we, uh, have for, we think our third week and we're working on Boone County as well. So definitely looking to be well-rounded for all three Northern Kentucky, most northernmost Kentucky counties. And, um, we also will be, um, having these recordings 
um, posted on the Behringer Crawford Facebook page. So if you haven't liked that page, please do so you get updates. Um, and uh, we really look forward to um, sharing additional artifacts. We have uh, our curator, Jason French, who um, is doing curators chats on a pretty much weekly basis. So if you go on to the Facebook page, you can also see Jason talking about some of the artifacts that we have at the museum about La Low Lagoon as well. Um, let's see, I think that is all. So on behalf of the, the museum and the board of trustees, we'll just say the last thing is that we're gonna do this for free for a while. And then eventually the interactive part will be for members only. Um, but we'll always have the recordings afterwards um, for everybody to view um, free of charge. So um, definitely hope that you'll consider becoming a member and um, we wanna provide a lot of um, content to our members. And so this is just one way that we're doing that while we're closed. So, but we actually plan to continue this even once we reopen. So on behalf of the full museum, thank you so much, Dave. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you all. Presentation. Take care, everybody. And if you have any more questions, you can always find me at the library. So give me a call. Excellent. You, uh, Dave, you should read the chat because okay. there are a lot of very nice comments um, that say um, what a great job and how much they appreciated your presentation. Yeah. So. Well, thank you. Absolutely. I, you can, I can talk your arm off about the Lagoon or Ludlow any day you like. And Brenda Clark, I see right in front of me, who used to work at the library, can, can attest to that. <laughs> She is enjoying her well-deserved retirement. Awesome. Well, I do think we should try to think about a walking tour. I think that sounds like a lot of fun. I've done that. Have I you? Love, I love doing walking tours of Lala. Great. The last one I did that was kind of similar was Beyond the Curb when I was yeah. at the Catalytic Fund, but it's been a little while, so maybe we could reinvigorate something like that. That would be a lot of fun. We'll do a combined library, yeah. um, Behringer Crawford Museum walking tour. I think that's great. Um, well, Lori's on here, so maybe we'll just give that to uh, Lori as an idea. Well, I'm going to sign off for now, so thanks all. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. Let's see. I don't know how to stop. Okay, I'm going to end the meeting.